Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you for everybody that's helped put this together. Um, I've asked Stacy Tours here to talk about something near and dear to our hearts, ADHD. Not just those with it, but those that get to work with us. And hopefully to help them understand that nothing we do is intentional. Um, but I'm going to, we're here to listen to her, not me. So. And I'm going to go find my notes. <laughs> Well, thank you guys seriously for coming. I'm so excited about this. Um, I'm Stacy Turris, and I am an accidental best-selling author because if you know me, you would never think that I could do a feat like becoming an author and definitely not um, not a best-selling author. Um, I'm super honored to be here and honored that, that Dusty took the time to um, get me out here and, and found the importance of, of just what we were talking about, um, understanding ADHD. And really what I want to talk about is understanding our superpowers because um, it really is amazing when you start digging down into ADHD and you realize that it's so much more than, than being distracted or hyperactive or um, whatever. Okay, so these are my Google audience rules, which is please do not remain seated if you don't fancy. You can pace in the corner, you can jump in the back, you can do whatever. You don't have to keep quiet during my talk because it'll be weird. So like anytime you guys want to just like say like, yeah, high five, this bump, like just feel free. Um, lost keys, phones, etc. will be in the corner. This is like if you have a large audience. Um, so they'll be in lost and found because I've noticed that when I do these talks that a lot of times there are some keys left in the seat or a badge left in the corner or whatever. So I'm not going to be able to remind you. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is the ADHD brain. And we're going to kind of get down and dirty on the ADHD brain. I want to give you guys kind of like my backstory. Um, <clears throat> I was not diagnosed until I was 33 years old, which was like 10 years ago. And so kind of growing up, um, I knew that something was different. I just didn't really know what it was. So my whole life, you know, I was always the life of the party, the fun, love, and party girl, um, pretty distracted all the time, uh, and had a hard time getting through school, got bad grades, um, got in fights, got arrested a couple times like I was definitely the girl living in Kansas looking for stimulation in all the wrong places hmm. so um basically I actually didn't even know I had any juice in my brain until I took my ACT test for college and we got the test scores back and my friends and I were all kind of like you know comparing and we all looked at mine like who knew that there was any juice in there whatsoever? So um, I always had a hard time. Got kicked out of my school. Um, that was for fighting. They told me that since I had bad grades, if I could get on the, come back to school and get on the honor roll, then I could stay in my school, which I meant I was a CD student, sometimes an F. I failed classes. I was in summer school every single summer. So they said, okay, you can come back to your home school, but you have to be on the honor roll. And I was like, done. So my junior year, I got to go back to my school and I was on the honor roll for my junior and senior year because I cared not about school. I cared about being with my friends. So that gave me the motivation to make good grades because other than a few classes, my teachers didn't. They weren't really teaching in a way that I connected with or understood. So, so that was in high school and then college. I mean, it was the same thing. You know, I took a, I think I came home with three credit hours the first semester. And then the second semester, I dropped out. And then the third semester, I was like, okay, my parents will kill me if I don't make it through college. So I'm just going to slam it. 
And I actually finished college in three years because I took 24 hours a semester and 18 hours in the summer. And that again was, it was because it was on my terms. I'm gonna do this because I wanna do this because I wanna show you guys that I can do it, but I'm doing it on my terms. So I just slammed it, graduated, got out of there. Um, I have to tell you about this. I, when I was preparing this speech, um, my business partner, I was talking to him like, you know, the pressure and blah, blah, blah. And we at that time thought it would be live. And, and he, he kind of looked at me and he was like, oh, by the way, I was told that I have to keep this PG-13. So I'm attempting to do that, okay? <laughs> I might throw some Snoop Dogg lingo out there to like keep it PG-13. The rating doesn't matter. Who told okay. you that? <laughs> that, that? That was if we were giving up on all that. Oh, good. But this one's good. This one's good. Okay, good. That was a request from So anyway, okay, so I can curse occasionally. All right, cool. So so basically, you know, I was the pressure and blah, 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 and he looked at me and he was like, it's not about you, bitch. It's not about you. It's about everybody that you're talking to and what you're imparting. And so I just wanted to bring that up because it, it literally that flip in perception helped me so much. And so we're going to talk about that later as a coping skill of how we can flip our perception to take it from a danger situation to owning the situation. Um, okay, so let's talk about the down and dirty ADHD brain. Um, basically, we know this. We know that there are two primary uh, neurotransmitters that are associated with ADHD. One of them um, is dopamine and one of them is norepinephrine. What's crazy about this is that some studies suggest that our tribe only has 10 to 25% of what a neurotypical person has in dopamine and norepinephrine. And why does that matter? It matters because with low, those low levels of dopamine, we have things like impulsivity searching for the stimulation, whether it's good stimulation, bad stimulation. I didn't care as long as my brain lights up, that's what I'm looking for. And that's how I got into the most trouble and why I did get arrested and why I did try drugs and, and everything else. Um, another part of dopamine is that sort of, if you're lacking in it, you have that lack of emotion. Sometimes you feel numb or something happens and you feel like you should feel a certain way and you don't, and then you feel crappy about yourself. Like how many times I thought I was probably a serial killer in the making because I had no emotions about something <laughs> is crazy. So lack of emotion, poor memory, brain fog, fatigue, no motivation, low libido. These are all things associated with your low dopamine levels. Um, norepinephrine, is associated with your attention and if you're distracted or not. So, so we're, we're working with these double chemicals with low chemicals on both sides of these. Low norepinephrine is inattention, distractibility, you can't focus, you have literally no sense of time whatsoever, you're not interested in things, you're not really alert and you can't remember crap and you're depressed and you're anxious. So, I mean, I can't think how many of you guys have just any of those issues. So, the other thing with ADHD is they have something called comorbid conditions. 50% of us have a comorbid condition, whether it's anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, you know, learning disabilities, um, tick disorders like Tourette syndrome, Sensory processing, do you guys, any of you guys have any sensory issues where like smells or feels or lights or anything overwhelms you? Sensory issues are huge. Um, and, and autism spectrum disorder, a lot of people have autism with ADHD or Asperger's with ADHD. Um, I love this. I put these into my notes. And I only did it like twice and then I forgot for the rest of the presentation. So <laughs> I have a site called braingangster.com where I teach mindful techniques and that's one of them. So everybody, I don't care how many, we all need to take three deep breaths. 
and oxygenate our brains because when we're stressed and our shoulders are hunched over and our little diaphragms are all scrunched, we're not getting that oxygen that we need to our brains, especially if you're working at Google. Um, okay, I want to talk to you guys about this really, really, really awesome, awesome buzzword that I love because it's the closest thing that I've ever found to jiving with what I feel ADHD is about. Um, when I, when I uh, was diagnosed, I decided I was going to write a book. And in order to write a book, I had to build a platform. And so I created a Facebook page, which is ADHD Superhero. And now it has about 250,000 um, followers on it. But what was so cool about this Facebook page is I started observing with their interactions. I started seeing this enormous picture of what ADHD was. And the way that ADHD is perceived and promoted as a disorder stopped making sense to me because I noticed that as opposed to like this disorder, we actually have human characteristics. There are these human traits that are associated with our tribe that are not disorders. And for example, like it's weird, but, but our tribe tends to have a really cool sense of humor. And so, and, and, a, and a charismatic personality. So it's not just like, oh, I can't do math. It's like there are different things with these different people. And I just started wondering, like, how, is, how does this work? It's like my, my example in my head was if you have two monkeys or say, a, I don't know. I don't know what is in a monkey or what is called a monkey or not. But say you have two monkeys, okay? One type, um, one type is really great at climbing trees, really great at climbing trees. The other type, it's, it's a monkey, but it's a different monkey. It's really great at gathering food. But the one that's gathering it, good at gathering food has a disorder. And the one that can climb trees doesn't because he can climb trees. It's like, hey, bitch, I can gather food. Like, let's work together. You climb trees, I'll gather food. So it was like, it doesn't make one monkey smarter than the other one. It's just a different variation of what they can do. So I started thinking, like, this is not a disorder. Like, these are true human traits. We're just variations with these different skill sets. And to separate us and to put one of us in a corner and say, you're not doing it right is bullshit. It is, it's bullshit because you can't do what I can do. So how is this a disorder? The disorder comes from us not being able to function in this side because we're not, we're supposed, we want to gather shit. We don't want to be up here climbing trees. You know what I'm saying? But let's work together. So that was kind of like, and, and so this buzzword neurodiversity is so amazing to me because it's saying there's no, it's all a variation. There's no one great particular thing that you need to be because all of us together are combined are what is going to make this world move forward with our innovation side, our logical side. We need all of it. And that's, I mean, I noticed that in politics, in religion, it's all about me, 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 my, my, you know, I'm going to box myself in right here and this is the right way to do it. And it's like, how about let's just take those, those labels away and think about the people in politics, you know, of course, with all the crazy stuff going on, but it's like we have Republican, Democrat, blah, blah, blah. But damn it, we have people in each side that have these amazing strengths that we can work together, but, but it's never like that. It's always just about me, 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 me. So I love the neurodiversity. And um, dictionary.com, I Googled it, said neurodiversity is a variation in differences in neurological structure and function that exists among human beings. 
So we're not looking at it as something pathological. We're looking at it as a normal variation, like you have black hair, you know, you have lighter hair. It's a variation of humans and it's a variation of our brains. And I love neurodiversity. And then they talk about how, well, neurodiversity is kind of complicated because everybody's neurodiverse. Well, that's true. And then in, in that neurodiverse kind of arc, we have the neurotypical and the neuro-minorities, right? Because our world is neurotypically driven. If, you, you know, paying your bills, getting to work, um, getting out Christmas cards, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's not, it's not driven for both sides. I love this. This is such a cool theory that supports you guys familiar with Tom Hartman. I love the way this guy thinks because he's like a money guy, but then he has this whole other side. Anyway, um, he has this hunter versus farmer theory. And in the hunter versus farmer theory, he talks about where it's just the same variation. You have the hunters and you have the farmers. And the hunters are very sense-driven and intuition-driven, right? So we can just be like, hauling, hauling, hauling. Oh my God, I hear something, you know, I'm gonna chase after this guy. Is that a noise? Oh my God, is that danger? That's how we work. Farmers are like, I'm going to till this ground. I'm going to plant a seed. I'm gonna patiently water it. I know that it's going to grow. And that's great because we need that, but we need these guys too. So it's a variation. We have the hunter, we have the farmer. And if you, I love that theory. If you guys want to look into it, and he talks about the traits, you know, as it appears as a disorder view. So, like, just say, for example, attention as a disorder view. Um, we don't have long attention spans. As a hunter view, no, we don't, but we're constantly monitoring our environment. And as a farmer view, the farmer are not distracted. They are like, I got to water my stuff. I have to pull the weeds, you know. So it's cool. Like, you can look at the chart. I'm not going to read it to you. But there are really cool things. And it just kind of promotes the fact that there is neurodiversity. And maybe we're, like, thinking this all wrong. Um, I think the biggest thing that I understood when I was learning all of this stuff is that I didn't realize that there were so many different layers to how complex we are as humans and that there are different, not just learning styles, but processing styles and different ways that we even perceive the world, which is so crazy. So the couple of things that I want to talk about is, you know, we all know about being an introvert, extrovert, but sometimes we don't know how that really affects us on a daily basis. And, you know, linear versus nonlinear thinking, it's a thinking style. Um, so these are the things that we're going to talk about. And so we're really going to dive into, like, who we are and, and understand and start kind of clearing up this mess of, of the, this stuff that, the, that people around us have put on us, you know, and made us feel as if we are... It's really affecting the self-esteem, I think, because we just feel like we're not doing things right. Um, this is a map of the introvert and extrovert's brain, and I love it because it's totally true, and you have to understand that when you're an extrovert and when you're an introvert, and, and our ADHD tribe is totally a mix of both, but, but and we all have certain traits of each side. But the biggest thing when you are trying to figure out if you're an introvert or an extrovert is how do you recharge? Do you recharge by being by yourself or do you recharge by being around a crowd of people? So that's the one the one thing that you can say, okay, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert. But then like I said, you know, we um we can take from both sides. So on being an introvert, getting energy from yourselves, you get drained by other people. Um, you need privacy. Mentally rehearsing before speaking, no lie. I'm not kidding you. I have to say Samoan words sometimes, and I will literally say them in my head like 20 times before I ever get brave enough to say them 
out loud. And, and even if I ha wanna have a conversation with someone, I do the whole conversation in my head, even their side. Like I will sit and I will have the whole conversation, them coming, you know, and then I'm like, all right, all right, I got this. And then I know what's gonna happen, so I'm prepared for it. So we learn by observing. It's the same thing we were talking about. We learn by observing. Um, loyalty to a few close friends. That is, that's so true because I have a ton of friends. I have a ton of friends, but I only have a very, very, very close circle of people that truly, truly know the essence of Stacey Turris. Um, we can concentrate we uh when we're when we're wanting to or if it's something that we're interested in we're reflective on things extroverts totally opposite they get and they get their energy from interaction and from other people and they feel energized by other people they're open they think out loud they want to be the center of attention they're comfortable like jumping into new situations they make lots of friends they're distractible they're impulsive and they're risk takers. And that sounds, you know, very familiar. So um, then we get into this really cool linear versus nonlinear thinking. And I love this. I love this because it's just so cool. And when you're a linear thinker, it's like this line. You solve issues by going from A to B to C to D to E, and it all makes sense. When you're a nonlinear thinker, we don't have a line. We have like this whole huge circle and we think in multi multiple directions at multiple times and we pull a lot of our information from inside of us. When you're logical, you're taking the facts and you're, you have the facts and this is how you're going to make your decision and you make your pros list and your cons list and no, when you're when you're a nonlinear thinker, that doesn't matter. Like that's not giving me information. I have the information I need. I have a big picture. Give me the big picture, because if you're just trying to tell me one thing after one thing after one thing, I'm not going to connect with it because I don't know what I don't know. Give me the big picture, and I'll fill in the little pieces, and then I'll know what I don't know, and then I'll ask questions, then I'll connect, and then I will learn the material. Um, who, okay, I have to see, how many of you guys relate to the, the auditory sequential with the filing cabinet that's nicely filed, there's no piles, okay, what about the spatial? <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> that's me, visual spatial, and it's so funny because this is the stuff that drives my husband absolutely crazy. Um, with visual spatial, the, the biggest thing is that we organize. This is the thing that really drives my husband nuts. I organize by piling, okay? Out of sight, out of mind for me. If I put something in a file cabinet, never in my life will I remember it's there. If I put something in my closet, never in my life will I remember it's there. So I have my floor closet or my floor drobe my chair closet, like I have my piles, and then I'll just pull the clothes from wh whatever's in the pile, like I never touch the closet, and sometimes I'll be like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot I had that, because out of sight, out of mind. Um, well, let's talk about the visual spatial, because the auditory sequential, um, since we're all visual spatial here, so we think in pictures, and, and, and we, have very good visual strengths. Like if I'm remembering where something is, my memory is not, oh yeah, I walked over here, I walked over here. My memory is this, I see this little whatever, this nook that it's in and I'm like, okay, there are only four nooks around here, so I'm gonna go find it. So I think in pictures. When people tell me things, I visualize everything. Like that's why if people get too graphic on things, I'm like, ah! my brain because it's like real in my head so anyway we're a whole part learner it's just like we were talking about that whole non-linear holistic view of things because we see so much more we see the big picture and when people are logical and linear they tend to be inside that one little spot right 
But we see more than that. And that's the thing with my business partner too. He is more of that, that linear thinker. So he will, he will be in that spot putting out fires and I will see things that will happen, how that will affect things months from now. And so that's kind of, that's really where we argue a lot is, um, is just him being in that space and me seeing, projecting what it's going to turn out like and him not believing me. And then we have to go through the process and then it's like, oh yeah, you were right. And I'm like, of course I was right. So we see the big picture. Problem with seeing the big picture, you miss the details. Housekeeping. <laughs> Housekeeping. My house is not cluttered, but if you go wipe the dust, you could like seriously write your name in it because I can tell when something I come in and I can tell if something's kind of a miss, but I will never ever see details. I will never be like, Oh yeah, there were pins on the table. Cause when I come in, I just, I'm seeing this whole big, and if nothing stands out at me, I'm not going to notice anything. Um, let me see. So visualizing words to spell them. Um, we organize our own way. We arrive at our solutions intuitively. There is so much intuition that we use in our tribe. It's insane. And I did that something else that I learned. Um, I just thought I was weird. And then I started learning that the, the intuitive thing is a huge part of our tribe. Do you guys all have like strong intuition? Yeah where you can you can kind of like feel how everything's going like it's more feeling as opposed to thinking sometimes um long-term visual memory is good short-term memory sucks we're turned off by drills we're turned off by repetition we don't want that uh, we want our own way of solving our problem so just tell us the problem but don't make us write your way down like this this map that these kids are doing at school now, and they're like that the core, whatever it's called, because I just get so annoyed, I don't even want to think about it. Don't make us do that. If we come up with the answer, we came up with the answer. Why do you care how we came up with the answer? So that's the stuff that we have to look at when you're a visual spatial. And this is something that really affects kids in school and us and in, in our jobs too. Of course, we have uneven grades. Because we don't care about some things and some things we love and that's what we're going to put our energy towards because that is what is lighting our brains up. If you're giving me something that I'm not interested in, my brain will shut down in a heartbeat and that's all there is to it. And it's not because I'm lazy. It's not because I'm being a pain in the ass. It's because my brain's like, sorry, that does not do anything for me. Okay, so then let's talk about the other thing that is really, really impacts um, ADHD years, which is the sensory processing issues. And it's crazy because it's kind of like our brain does not have the ability to determine what is something we should be paying attention to and something that we can ignore. So when we are in a room, we're looking at the lights, I hear the fan of the projector. I see that thing blinking over there. Um, it's like all of these sensory issues and my brain's going, hey, 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 look, 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 look. And, I'm just, and that's why it's like so overwhelming when you have these sensory issues because things like fluorescent lights can throw you off. You're trying to be productive at work and you have fluorescent lights above you flickering and there's no way you're gonna have a productive day. Um, some, of the, some of the symptoms that are just kind of like behaviors that you'll notice with people that have these sensory issues is like the touching thing. I'm, I'm pretty hardcore about being touched if I'm not expecting it. And I definitely don't like touching like wet laundry. When I was a kid, I was at school, I was in elementary school and they made us take a milk with every lunch. And you know how they're all like moist and dewy on the outside of the wax cartons? And it drove me crazy. So I started wrapping 
a napkin around the milk so I wouldn't have to touch it. And then I remember looking around one day and like the whole lunchroom had their milk with their napkins wrapped around it. And I was like, yeah, boy, that's how you do it. But those sensory issues, they are a big deal. They can affect our lives so much. So when we don't know that that is something that's affecting us, it's hard. So these are some of the things, you know, we're affected by what we eat, the taste, the texture. We're affected by smells. We're affected by sound. My daughter used to just freak out every time she flushed the toilet when she was a kid because she has the same issues going on. So, so these sensory issues are, are really important to understand because then you'll understand like some of where your reactions are coming from or your kids' reactions are coming from. But, you know, like, I don't like getting my hands wet. So I know, my husband knows I'm not going to touch wet laundry. Like I'll dry, I'll dry, you know, I'll fold, but I'm not going to touch wet laundry and I'm not going to do dishes because I can't stand having my hands wet. Um, yeah, the odors, we hear the background noises, which is super, super duper distracting. We have these empathic tendencies, and this is, I feel like, something that is the least understood because we're kind of on the cusp of it not being so woo-woo now. Like, it used to be, like, empathic, like, we can feel energy is weird. You know, that sounds like, like um, metaphysical stuff. But now they're starting to determine, obviously we're made of energy, Our, all, everything that we do puts off energy, and of course it makes sense that we can read that energy through our own energy systems. So it's not woo-woo anymore, I don't feel silly talking about it anymore because it's so common with our tribe, I just feel like it's very, very important to understand because this is something that is just so hard as a sensitive person to try and, and you know, take these. And I am going to go through the 30 most common traits of an empath because, because I feel like it's that important. Um, we just know stuff. You know when someone is lying. We have a BS meter like no other. So we know stuff. We can feel stuff. We get these these, I call it an impression. So when I get an impression, I have to work, I, I, I will get beat with it until I kind of deliver it to who I'm supposed to deliver it to. So for example, just last week, um, I manage a reggae band, New Roots. And, um, you know, in the music industry, you have to deal with some, you know, sketchy people. So I'm constantly scanning, I call it scanning. I'm scanning people, I'm feeling their energy, I can feel intentions. So you can feel when there's like an intention, if there's a good intention or a bad intention. So I spend a lot of time kind of feeling intentions. Well, there's this guy that, um, that we work with and I've never even met him in person, so I've never, and I never had an issue tr needing to scan him because he was always on the up and up. But the other day, um, or last week, I just got this strong impression, like this dude is shady, this dude is shady, this dude is shady, this dude is shady. Tell Lole, who is the business partner, you need to tell him. And I hate it when that happens because I look like a total crazy person when all of a sudden someone gets a text and it's like, hey, I just had this gut feeling that, you know, don't think I'm crazy. So anyway, um, so finally I was like, all right, I sent the text to my business partner, I said, hey, I'm just telling you, I'm getting these impressions, this dude is shady. Um, and he was like, uh, I can confirm that after what happened last night. And it was this whole crazy story, but it just shows you like the stuff that we're picking up, even if the person that you're picking it up from, most of the time they will not confirm what you're feeling. And as a matter of fact, a lot of times they will deny it. And then you really feel crazy. But what I have figured out is that I'm right every time, every time. So now I don't even, if someone doesn't confirm it or if they even deny it, it used to just make me feel like confused because, because the words and the energy don't match up. 
right? And that's so confusing. And so anyway, so now I just I just trust it. But um, being in public places can be overwhelming because we're getting energy from every single freaking person. So when I used to go to the mall, it was like protect myself and just haul through and just try and get, or airports are crazy too. Um, watching things on TV, cruelty, tragedy. I went and saw an Ayurvedic doctor because I was just suffering from such massive anxiety. This was before I was diagnosed. And um, he, he told me, he said, you have to stop watching the news. You can't watch the news. Like, you can't watch the news. And I stopped watching it. And I'm telling you, my I've never had anxiety ever again because everything that was happening, everything on the news, all the bad stuff, it just layered on me and layered on me and layered on me. And when you are an empath or you are sensitive, you're feeling everything for other people too. So it's not just your own shit. It's your shit, your shit, your shit, your shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's so overwhelming that sometimes you don't even want to leave the house and you stay inside and you kind of get into this little ball and your energy gets all sucked in. You can even pick up physical symptoms off of other people. Um, a lot of times empaths have these, these kind of digestive order disorders because where you get that energy is right here. That's where you're kind of feeling the energy. And so if you're getting that just crap going in there, a lot of people can suffer from like irritable bowel syndrome, all those things where, where you're, you're storing that toxicity. We're always looking out for the underdog. Um, <laughs> strangers want to offload their problems on you. My Uber driver from the airport to the hotel here was a prime example. This guy probably told me his whole life story. And he was, after we got out of the car, he was like, I have no idea why I just told you all that. And I'm like, I know, because that happens to me all the time. I'm constantly fatigued. We're drained of our energy because we're constantly creating energy for other people or to protect ourselves from other people's energy. It takes a lot of effort to be able to, to kind of bounce that energy off and keep that protective circle to yourself. Um, drawn to healing, whether you're a nurse or whether you're um, acupuncture or, or like I'm a Reiki master. So because I understand energy and I can feel it, I can manipulate it. And that's why I learned Reiki because it's such an awesome tool to be able to manipulate energy that way. And I know I'm sounding crazy, but I promise like in 10 years, you guys will all be like, oh shit, she was right. Um, a lover of nature and animals, I think that's probably obvious. Gets bored or distracted easily if not stimulated. You'll notice that these, all these things, these things that make us up as people start to overlap. And, and it's like this ADHD thing that they're talking about. It's like, well, that's kind of like gets bored or distracted. You know, it's kind of like a combination of of these other things that we have with the personalities. How do you and reconcile how do you reconcile 15 and 16? What do you mean? Oh, need for solitude and gets bored or distracted if not stimulated. Well, the way that I do it is when I am trying to get my energy back is my need for solitude. So I go back and forth. Now, if I am too much if I have not been around other people or I've not been stimulated, I start feeling that too. And so then I know, and that's what we're talking about, talk about balance. I can jump back. Now I recognize when I need to jump back and forth. So we do need stimulation. We do need that. We can't feel stagnant, but we also don't want to be overstimulated. So it's just you jump back and forth depending on your needs at that time. Um, we can't do things we don't enjoy. That sounds like ADHD too. Yeah, we're not going to do anything that doesn't light our brain up. We strive for the truth. ADHDers, if there is one thing that will piss us off, it is something that is unjust. If we see something that is not fair, that is not just, that is something that will make us insta-pissed. And that's another thing with ADHDers is that insta-pissed quality because... Well, it's called 
bouts of rage. <laughs> I call it passion. <laughs> but yeah, we get that. We get that instantaneous feeling. Um, we love, obviously, adventure, freedom, and travel. Now, not liking clutter, that's the one thing that is, I'm not sure about that one. Because on one hand, I do like clutter. It just has to be my own kind of clutter. So I do like clutter. I feel happy when I'm surrounded by all my little weird stuff on my desk. But it has to be my own stuff. Um, routine, rules, controlling, it's totally imprisoning to us. We cannot handle anybody trying to put us into a box or structure us uh, too much. We're great listeners, as the Uber driver will tell you. We definitely have an intolerance to narcissism, and I think that just goes with that whole, um, you know, not, not being okay with injustice. Um, the ability to fill the days of the week, which is so funny to me, because you know when you're like, oh my God, it felt, it, today's Friday, it felt like Thursday all day. There is something to that because when, when um, if you don't know what day of the week it is, the collective, we all know, say we all know it's Thursday. So the collective is putting off this, it's Thursday energy. So sometimes you can, those are the kind of weird things that you can, that you can read into if you're really um, in touch with your energy. Appear moody, shy, aloof, disconnected. Man, that happens a lot because when we have too much going on, we'll shut down. And I'll talk about that later. But um, yeah, when I first met my business partner, he thought I was like a total snob because I had no interest in anything outside of what was going on in my head. I wasn't open to meeting people, I, you know, and so we can come across that way. And I think we also come across that way because we are afraid to be authentic with most people because we're afraid of getting judged. Um, our awesome... Where was that list from? Huh? Where was the list from? Uh, the 30... Oh, let me see. Hold on. The Mind Unleashed. And I can give you guys copies of the slides too, so you guys have all this information. Yeah. I'll be able to share those out. You share them with me. So I'll okay, be able to share cool, them out perfect. All right, so I want to talk about our ADHD superpowers because the thing about ADHD superpowers is that they really are amazing if we are given the tools to actually use them. Um, ADHDers are incredibly creative. We have this massive problem-solving ability. Like I said earlier, a, a, a really awesome sense of humor, charismatic personality, and the enhanced tuition. But the superpowers that we should use and aren't really invited to use very often is that drive of hyper-focus. Hyperfocus is the most amazing thing in the world. We do not, and we don't know time. We don't have to pee. We don't have to eat. We don't have to get out of our chair. We have literally transformed ourselves when we get into that flow state. We are in space at this point. There, we're not physically connected to the earth. There's nothing grounding us. There's nothing pulling us down. We are in this state of flow and and this hyper focus when we get in that flow we can sustain it for hours and hours and hours and that's what is so crazy about adhd is people get so confused like oh you're distracted oh you can't concentrate on paying your bills for 10 minutes but you can you know go do this for seven hours and it's like yeah because this does not do anything for my brain this just shuts my brain down. This makes my brain excited. And my brain is going to go towards what's exciting because that's what I'm all about. I want something to light my brain up. So it's confusing when, there, when, when you can hyper-focus, but you can't focus. Um, that, that charismatic personality, I, I have met so many people. And, and on my Facebook page, just getting to know all these people and I can tell, I can honestly tell a lot of times if I'm talking to someone and in my head I'll be like, oh yeah, I know, I know this person because it's just this, this, they're kind of more like, ah, out there and funny and, 
and crazy and wacky and so generous, the biggest hearts in the world because there is that, that sensitivity and that empathic tendencies that they have. Um, so smart, so smart. And that's what makes me the most sad is like I said, I didn't know, I didn't even know I was smart and not that my ACT scores say anything because they don't, but I didn't even know I had like any juice in there whatsoever. But now as I've grown older and I've kind of just came in control of my own life and said, all right, I'm not focusing on your bullshit stuff that you guys think I should be doing. I am going to focus on what makes me happy. And I'm going to focus on the things that I'm going to focus on my strengths because why am I going to put any energy towards doing this shit that I don't want to do? Why am I going to put any energy towards, towards things that don't make me passionate and don't make me you know, have this drive and, and I'm so, um, driven by helping other people that I had to dump, I had to dump to, in order to do this Facebook page and do this book, I had to dump stuff that just didn't make sense to me, which was like, you know, Christmas cards and, you know, that weird stuff and like holidays and <laughs> Like the weird stuff that all these other people put on me and I'm like, wait a second. I think these holidays are dumb Like why am I stressing out about this stupid Valentine's Day or whatever? Like it doesn't I don't even jive with it and I'm supposed to be doing all you know what I'm saying like so I just dumped that stuff I just got tired of and I figured out like I'm this is my life at the end of the day This is my life and I'm gonna do it the way I need to do it in order to be happy because when I'm happy, my family's happy, my friends are happy, everybody's happy when everybody's happy. Um, a strong sense of fairness, that's that injustice thing, which I just love and also gets me in so much trouble because I can't stand even, I think this lady in Target was just screaming at her child. And it was so excessive because normally I would never get into anything, but it was so excessive. This baby was probably three years old and this lady was just, and I just felt that fire raise up in me and, and you know, it just, it wasn't fair. And I let that lady know and you know, that's not cool that you're a, like, what do you treat? How do you treat your kid when you're at home and be like, how, how are you communicating this way? So anyway, it gets me in trouble a lot, but, but I fight for things that I believe in and I'll fight hardcore for it because I think that's a trait that we were given because our world needs that so much, you know? So all of these things, it's like, what, how can we contribute with these superpowers? How can we contribute to the world? It's not, remember, it's not about you, bitch. It's about, it's about everything else. It's not about me. It's about how can I take what I have and, and contribute to making this place an awesome world to live in. Um, last of the romantics, that one I'm going to have to totally just not agree with at all because I'm probably the least romantic person that you'll meet. Um, but engaging conversational skills. You talk to an ADHD or you will never run out of stuff to talk about because we know so much about so many things that it's always like an awesome conversation and we can always jump in on anything. The compassion that we have, you know, our persistence and our resilience. Living with this, and I'm talking about the superpowers, but living with this is a nightmare. It is the biggest struggle, and it's, it's not just an occasional nightmare. It is from the second you wake up until the second you go to bed, a nightmare. And sometimes the way that we get through it is day by day, and sometimes it's hour by hour, and sometimes it's like minute by minute because it's a constant source of outside struggles with how our family perceives us, how our spouses or partners perceive us, how our kids perceive us, how the PTA perceives us. And so it's so I don't I I don't want to make it sound like ADHD is like the best thing ever because it freaking sucks. It sucks and it's hard and it's a struggle. But basically, this is what we're working with. 
and we really don't have a choice in the matter and it's you know more shit than sugar for sure but but at the end of the day we have to start looking at what we do have and how we can make a difference with these strengths that we have and it's so funny because you know you take these you take these people, like I said, it's like, we do have strengths that other people don't have. So it's not like there's this deficit. It's not like here's this group of people and we can't do some of that stuff. That's not how it is. It's this group of people, we can't do some of that. This group of people, they can't do some of this. So, so we have to start thinking in broader terms of, of, of the collection of everybody meeting together to form this 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 foundation that is huge and strong and and, and a team um so, contagious so okay. these last few slides this is kind of like the here's everything you get because you are low on dopamine exactly. and dopamine. exactly Here, here's your bad list of six slides and here's your here's here, your pluses here of is what people perceive as bad yeah they're not right. our strengths but come on now really am i a bad person because i don't do christmas cards like that's the stuff, it's so crazy. That is the stuff that would put me into a depression. That's the stuff that I would get so overwhelmed by that I would go into a depression or the cave or whatever, stupid stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, so I'm like, okay, no, yeah, we can't, we're not good at that stuff. But look at this, like, do you want me to do Christmas cards? Or do you want me to put that energy towards building this massive, Facebook page of ADHDers that every day are feeling better about themselves. Like, what matters here? What matters? Like, I can come up with coping skills. Hey, listen, this is my coping skill for Christmas cards. Y'all ain't getting them. That's my coping skill. And you're going to like it or you're not going to like it, but I don't care because I'm happy. I'm happy. And so so it's just that perception. It's, it's still having – having like a support group like my husband knows my strengths and my struggles and so he just jumps in when he needs to and we've been married for like 16 years at this point so which is rare for an adhd -er. um but, but because of that because he he so much accepts me for who i am and has gone through this process for me or with me and now understands the physiological reasons why I do stuff. And it's not because I'm trying to piss them off. It's like, sorry, dude, that's how my brain works. That's what it is, you know? And so, so once you start owning your stuff, like I'm telling you, the hardest part when I was diagnosed was the people around me. The people around me made me feel like shit. And it was like, you're not doing that. You know, like I said, my mom, bless her heart, she is a logistics engineer. She is the most linear, you know, she doesn't have any of the depression and anxiety. And so I am come exploding into the world like, Wah! and she's just like, okay, well, you need to get organized and you need to not procrastinate. And, you know, that was her way of fixing me because she thought she needed to fix those parts. But it's like, okay, no, 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 because it doesn't matter. You're not going to help me. I'm unhelpable in that area. But take me over here and I'll show you like the magic. Let me show you magic. It's not in this stuff. So, um, yeah, this is the stuff that brings us to our knees. Poor time management. We cannot manage time because we have no sense of time. Time in our head does not exist. And so unless you really build those muscles and – you know, you can build these muscles, and I've had to build muscles, especially in the introvert-extrovert thing. You know, I'm an introvert, and being a band manager, I have to deal with venues and everything else and, you know, a, a late nights and music, and, and I've had to really build those extrovert muscles, whereas before I would just have a heart attack having to go up and talk to, like, a venue guy. But now I've built those muscles. I've built those muscles. And so now it's easier. I don't even really think about it. So you can build muscles. But damn it, do it because you want to. Not because somebody's asking you to do it or forcing you to do it or, or has their own plan for why you should do it. Do it for you. That's what you need to do. Disorganization. Now we're not organized. 
we can't plan, we can't prioritize. Difficulty with paperwork, hell no. You know what, my husband and I get in a fight every year when it comes time for rugby of who's filling out the forms. And it's a joke because our, our the lady that um, takes care of, manages the whole thing is like, she'll come to him and she'll be like, hey, you need to fill out your rugby forms. And he's like, give them to Stace. And she's like, I already asked her. And she said, give them to you. So it's like a joke that we cannot do the paperwork. Forgetfulness. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you guys how many times I have driven to Arkansas when I should have been going to Oklahoma from Kansas. Seriously. Because when you – do you guys ever do that where you just, like, miss your turn because you're so in your head and you're just, like, on – on autopilot, oh, yeah. I tell, I'm telling you, I have to put my GPS on no matter where I'm going, even if I know how to get there, because I will not turn. I will just drive straight forever. So my GPS is not like, this is how you get here. My GPS is like, turn, bitch, turn right now, turn. So yes, and the inconsistency. The one thing I say about our tribe is that we are consistently inconsistent and that is because we are in a constant state of reacting to our environment so our behavior depends on the environment we're in our behavior is inconsistent because our environments are inconsistent so we're not the inconsistent inconsistent ones it's how our reactions are and how we have to have such strong reactions to our environments impulsive decision making yes I mean we all have our impulsivity and, um, you know, sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. But, but they're all tools. Like, these are tools that we can use. And, and, and we can do really amazing things with them if we just start putting them in that frame of mind where it's a tool. Um, let me see. Other stuff associated with ADHD, of course. Substance abuse, divorce, child abuse, family conflicts, underemployment, smoking, eating disorders. Basically, with our, our low dopamine levels, we are looking for anything that's going to light us up. So drugs, yes. Alcohol, yes. Porn, yes. Um, shopping, yes. And, and these things, it's not to say that these things are bad. I mean, you know, you don't want to be like doing meth or anything, but I wouldn't mind a little joint now and then. But what I'm saying is these things aren't bad, but, but we're self-medicating. <laughs> Sorry, Dusty. <laughs> but we're self-medicating, and we are going overboard. So if we balance it out, like, you know, going out and drinking occasionally is fun. You know, um, going shopping occasionally is fun. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to watch porn. I mean, it doesn't do anything for me, but I'm sure it could be fun, like, if you do it occasionally. But it's when we do it too much and we're self-medicating with it, that we can become unbalanced. And, and as ADHD years, we, we have a hard time, obviously, um, kind of controlling those impulses. And then when we get into it, some, we want something to make us feel good. We want that dopamine drop. And then we, so we feel the dopamine drop, and then it goes away, and we're like, I need some more dopamine. So it's just the, this, this continuous cycle. And so... What I do is I try to do other things that will give me that dopamine drop. A, I eat foods that, that give me a dopamine boost. B, I do things that give me a dopamine boost. I mean, I slightly endanger my life sometimes, but it feels good. It feels good to go on adventures and I'll go on road trips and drive somewhere I've never seen because even on a road trip, even if you're just like, I'm gonna go take an hour and drive somewhere random and you're seeing new things, it doesn't matter if it's, a, a farm or whatever these new sites and everything light your brain up so there are natural ways that we can light our brain up um, without kind of going towards these less healthy options that is me getting arrested for real <laughs> I didn't really know that he was gonna keep the handcuffs on because my husband was like can I get a picture um, so these things, poor driving record, you know, all of these things that have to do with not being able to control our impulses, about trying to self-medicate. The poor, this, I was arrested because I got a ticket on New Year's Eve, the night I actually caught my hair on fire, which is why my book is named Here's Done Catching Our Hair on Fire. I got this ticket 
it was three tickets. Okay, it was three tickets. It was like brake lights and no insurance and blah, blah, blah. Well, then they had a warrant roundup. So, of course, I didn't pay my fee and whatever. So, so they, um, they actually came and got me and arrested me in front of my children and, uh, <laughs> and then took me with them in the cop car on, to gather the rest of the criminals, which was like the best day ever. I was like, I was in a funk before that happened, okay? After I got arrested, I was like high for six weeks. My my chemicals were just on point because it was it was so funny. I mean, they, they were really cool, and, and we would go to places, and you know, they'd go up and knock. There was like SWAT team style too, like it was hardcore. I was like, I hope they didn't do that in my neighborhood. But and of course, all the neighbors saw me getting arrested too. But but um, and then they'd come back, and you know, nobody would answer the door, and they'd come back, and I'm like, that's bullshit. You know, they were in there. Go around the back, like. It was so cool because it, it was lighting my brain up. I, I was totally engaged with it. So, I mean, honestly, like getting, getting arrested was like one of the best days ever. And it totally flipped that switch for me and gave me those chemicals I needed. What I figured out too is that roller coasters will do the same way. So if I'm feeling, if I'm feeling that bleh, feeling and I need to get light my brain up, I can go ride a roller coaster and that'll help me for about, I don't know, a good week and a half. So it's just learning these things. You're like, that lit me up. Okay, I'm going to do it again. Sleep disorders are crazy. Like most of the time, if you don't have a sleep disorder, you probably don't have ADHD because I, I think that they even like that is a key thing with ADHD is either not being able to go to sleep not being able to stay asleep. A lot of ADHDers are on a, a schedule where nighttime is their time. And it doesn't jive with you guys having to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning. So, um, How else would you get work done? Huh? How else would you get work done? I know, exactly. Exactly. It doesn't jive with what? It also doesn't jive with the medicine. No, it doesn't. The medicine, if, you're, like, if you're medical, your medication is like so eight in the morning till five in the afternoon yes. is when the dose is working. Yes. So. Yeah, and and it's like, and some people can't even take their like their third their third dose because it messes with their sleep so much. Um, I run around like an unmedicated maniac most of the time, unless um, I have an I have an easy time getting to sleep. I just can't stay asleep. But a lot of people are are those night owls. Like it's just that's how we roll. Um. It's easy to see why we, why we have such a hard time when it comes to executive function skills because not all ADHDers um, are impaired in their executive function skills, but a lot of us are. And that's where those executive functions are where all of the stuff like organizing, prioritizing, focus, alert, you know, modulating your emotions. Um, using your your memory and your recall and and self-regulating your emotions that's all executive function if you're an ADHD or without those executive function skills I mean that shows you right there right there in that one little thing um, it shows you from attitudemag.com by the way I have to tell you guys that they are the most amazing online resource I love them. They have saved my life. They have so much material about everything. If you want to get online and learn about ADHD, you go to attitudemag.com. They are amazing. But yeah, so 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 where we're supposed to, in a normal person, executive functions, you can analyze a task. You can plan how you're going to address it. You can organize the steps you need. You have a timeline. You know what you have to get done in order to be done. And you shift the steps if you need to. If you don't have that, if you don't have those executive function skills, then, um, you know, we're not working with anything. Um, oh, here's another one of the mindful lifestyle techniques. So this is something that's really cool. A lot of times we have problems calming ourselves, right? Whether we're mentally or physically agitated. Um, and proprioceptors are, are are what we have in our body that that send message a message to our brain telling our brain where we are um, relative to space okay 
So, so when your proprioceptors are activated, it's saying to your brain, okay, you're all good. You're standing upright. You're, you know, you're doing everything you're supposed to do. And there's this calming sensation. So, so something that you guys can, you know, if you talk to your kids or whatever, uh, what I notice myself doing this all the time and I will just sit there and squish my arms and it's activating those proprioceptors and it's telling my brain, it's all okay. You're all good. And it gives you that kind of relaxing and I can do it in my hands too. So it's just, it's something, it's a really great tool that you can use and you can find more of that stuff on um, braingangster.com. Um, our tribe also has to deal with, with the three P's, which is like this insane cycle of perfectionism, procrastination, and paralysis, right? Most of the time the three P's come in when we have these big long-term projects, there's no deadline, so it just feels like it's gonna go on for freaking ever. And none of us are good at long-term projects. Like, we wanna be in, kick ass on the project, and then beat it and go on to the next one because that's, that's how we can sustain that focus and that's how we sustain that interest because after a while, when a project's going on too long, we're, not, we're losing interest in it. Like, it's not lighting us up like it should. So with this perfectionism, though, a lot of times it's, it will stall on, on a project that we're doing because, um, you know, if you, especially when we're those, those whole learners, the holistic learners, we have this black and white concept of, of what the whole picture should look like. And when we're just getting started on a project, because we have this grand vision of what it should be, when we're starting the project, we're going, okay, I'm gonna do this. Wait, does this, is this Pulitzer Prize winning sentence right here? No, Ugh. okay, I'm gonna start over, okay. So it's, it's like, if we can't do it perfect, then we will procrastinate on it, right? We need to do it perfect. Well, then you start procrastinating. You guys know what happens when you start procrastinating. That stuff turns into a monster. Like, it could be a phone call. How many of you guys hate phone calls, making phone calls? It's the worst thing ever, right? Like, if I have to call, like, a doctor's office. Months. Or, yeah. or what? Months. It's yes. Months. Insurance. Like, I no, dude, I can't do it. My husband is the, the phone caller because I cannot even force my, so it'll be like, okay, I'm going to make the call. And then the next day, it's just like, Ooh, that doesn't feel fun. I'm not going to do that. And then it just gathers this, this, this intensity and it turns into a monster. And then finally, like you're forced to do it and you're like, Oh my God, that took me one minute. And I just waited three months, <laughs> three months to do it. It's so crazy. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, we need to snapping out of the paralysis because you can always choose to not do undefined long-term projects right oh yeah you totally can but sometimes you can't choose you know sometimes you can't and so so with the paralysis i mean and i'm going to show you tips like when we can't choose there are ways that we can hack our brains to get through that so when there's um, a consequence huh when there's a consequence so right exactly it, yeah exactly now, tomorrow, well that's the thing it's like it's like and i'll talk about this later but it's like when 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 we're doing something that we if if the world was perfect we would not choose to do it mm -hmm. and if it's somebody else especially will build resentment towards that person for putting us in that situation right so it's not healthy for anybody so yeah i'll talk about that um in a little bit but with this the, with this perfectionism the way that i that has really helped me is this 80 20 rule it helps me just get started because where before I was trying to be perfect in every single thing, this, when I got the 80-20 rule, it was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna lay down a foundation. I don't care if there, I don't care if there's misspellings, I don't care what, I don't care if it's not, you know, complete thoughts, I'm gonna lay it down. And I'm just doing the 80%, I'm spending, I'm spending 20% of my time laying down the 80 percent of the foundation and then then when that's all done then i go back and i will spend 80 percent of the time perfecting that last 20 percent and that's really helped me so that i don't get stuck in that 
that th then, I, then I don't have to procrastinate because I'm like, I'm not putting any expectations on myself. You know, there's nothing to procrastinate because it's not an issue. I don't have to worry about it being perfect and it takes a lot of pressure off. So the 80 20 rule, I just love. Um, balance is so huge with us. And, and I want to talk to you about the cave because the cave gets, the cave gets confused with depression a lot. And for us, the cave is, is just a safe place to go when either we're overwhelmed or we're overstimulated or we have um, just come off of like a big project. You know how like big projects just whoop your ass. And, and so the cave is there. And, and even if you just need to, like maybe something happened um, and you need to process some information, when we have stuff going on around us, we're not processing information. We're basically like, do, 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 you know, trying to, so there's no processing going on. So that stuff just stays in our head and it just muddles up and muddles up and, and nothing becomes clear anymore. And so the cave is like, it's not depression. It's a space to go to process. It's a space, like sometimes when I process, I will sit on my couch and I will look out of the window for an hour, an hour and a half. And I don't have any involvement with what's going on whatsoever. I just let my brain do its thing. If it makes sense, it would do, I don't care. I'm just letting it do its thing because that processing is so important. And it's so hard because when you come home and you've been so overstimulated at work all day, and then your kids are like, oh, and your husband's like, oh, I need this and I need this. Or your wife's like, I need some us time. And you're just like, I can't, I need to like have some alone time and, and people take it so personal when you, when you need alone time, they, they think it's them. And it's again, what's our saying today? It's not about you, bitch. It's not, it's, I need some alone time. It's, I need to process. I need to figure this stuff out. And when I do, I will be a better wife. I will be a better mom. I'll be a better friend because I have cleared my head and I've allowed to do my brain what it needs to do. Um, we do, we do get it confused with depression. And what's really scary about the cave is that it feels like you're going to be in there forever. Like you don't know you're going to pop out of it and you're pretty much numb. You have no emotions. Um, you again, feel like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? And, and there's nothing wrong. It's like, it's like, okay, the pixel, right? The pixel, it can stay charged for how long? Like, Good day. Yeah. Right? Which is amazing. It puts out this energy, but as the day goes, obviously the charge gets less and less and less and less. Okay. Well, that's like us. Obviously we're putting energy out, but then when we're, when we plug the phone in, this is, where is this a pixel? When we oh, plug the nice phone. Yeah. Okay. When we plug the phone in, um, so it's, you know, say we have 10%, we plug the phone in and I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a call on it. Oh, I better look online. Oh, I better. And it's like, why isn't this, why is this still at 2%? You're using it. You're not letting it fully recharge. It's never going to recharge if you don't leave it alone and just let it get back to its full charge. And so that's what we are like. We are like that in that we have to, I cannot even tell you enough how important it is to implement this in your life and to educate people around you that you have to do this because if you don't, you will be in that cave forever. And the worst part about the cave is when you don't understand what it is, you fight it because you think it's depression. You think it's whatever you think it, you feel bad about yourself because you're there. You feel bad that you're putting other people through it. And so, so, you know, we have to, we have to let ourselves go through that process. How are we doing on time? Um, he's still recording, but if we can move faster. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we were only scheduled to go through one, but if we oh have gosh. a little bit better okay. time. It's okay. So, um, basically, you know, it's about balance. We have these basic needs for our tribe, our needs, acceptance, alone time, processing time, our recharge time, stimulation, going into flow, structure, but not structure that is a thumb on us, structure that allows us to move within it, but doesn't, but tethers us so that we're not flying away, if that makes sense. 
Um, we need to grow. We are creatures that need to grow and evolve. That is how we are. And our need for freedom. We cannot have people telling us what to do and where to be and, and everything else. And that again, that need for fairness. When we're unbalanced, it looks like addiction, depression, anxiety, disease, weight issues, high-risk behavior. This is the thing about balance. When we balance, we balance like on a teeter-totter, right? Like a normal neurotypical would balance like they'd stand in the middle of the teeter-totter, right? And they'd balance. That's not how we roll. We are like running, like we're like back and forth. This is how we are balancing constantly. Constantly, this is our every single day. And these people that are like, uh, 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 look at us like, aren't you exhausted? Yes, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's freaking exhausting. It's exhausting existing this way, it is. So, so give us these coping skills. Let us do what we need to make it through uh, 80 some years of this um the best this is the best thing I, I love this saying don't shit on me and I won't shit on you don't have people saying you should do this you should do this you should do this you should do this because they don't know you they don't know how you work they don't know how you think so don't shit on me and I won't shit on you release all the expectations of the people surrounding you because it's bullshit because it's coming from their point of view, not ours. Release the expectations that don't jive with you. Just like I said with the Christmas cards. It didn't jive with me. I, don't, I, my, I have Facebook. People see my kids all the time. Why do I have to sit there and go through the stress of the holidays, which is totally insane for 88 years anyway? Laugh at yourself. This stuff is funny. I mean, the things that I have done pulling gas pumps out of their sockets. And I mean, we do funny stuff, like it is funny. We have to have a sense of humor about the stuff that happens. Um, so stop beating yourself up, set yourself up for success by, you know, enlisting help from your, your family and your friends and, and tirelessly explore your passions because that is the something that will motivate you, drive you, light you up, and make you engaged with your surroundings and make you engaged with other people because connection is so important. And a lot of times we disconnect from people because it's too much. So if we're doing it on our terms, it can be so positive and so beneficial. Um, you know, on the, on, on when you're finding your passion, you, you can't bury yourself before you start by having expectations. Like say you're like, I really love jewelry designing but how am I gonna make money on it? Well, you don't have to make money on it. Don't put that on yourself. Like, let yourself explore your passions without having these expectations that you have to make money or you have to do this or you have to do this. Because you wanna jump in and roll around in it and see what it feels like. And if you do jump around and roll around and you gain knowledge and then you feel like you've learned enough about that passion, move on to the next passion. Like, people are so, Oh, you can't focus. Oh, you're always interested. Yeah, I'm interested in a bunch of stuff. And I want to know a little bit about a lot of things. So if I want to move on to another passion, let me. That's my thing. That's what I want to do. And that's why I know so much shit about so many things, because I allow myself to do that. Um, it's okay to be a, a jack of all trades and master of none. In the work environment, having leaders that delegate tasks by strength versus just a job title is an, a, a trend that is just so helpful. And I worked in a corporate environment and I worked for the, the pre, in the president's office for um, Yum Restaurants International, which is like Pizza Hut, KFC. So I, you know, working for the president, his admin was my boss and she was so freaking smart about seeing the gifts that I had. And so she delegated that way. She delegated these six people by the gifts and, not, and, and their strengths and not just by a title because, because I would have never succeeded in that, um, in that environment if she hadn't have done that. So obviously the best, the best careers are things that have high stimulation firefighter, police officer, you know, can, ER can you, doctor. Would you go back one yeah. slide? Would you talk a little bit more about this, the state project oriented? Because that's a big thing. Yeah. At, at Google. I mean, so many times we have 
projects we get that we have to spend time on. Yeah. What, what do you mean by tasks that don't last long? Well, the projects that don't last, so those never-ending projects, those mm -hmm. the projects that are going to last forever, we are balls to the wall. That is how we roll. We cannot put that much energy that we put into things for an extended amount of time. So we will go in with our whole might, but but we can't we cannot sustain that energy. So that's why those short-term projects we can kill it on those because we can ex we can express our energy and sustain it for those shorter amount of times. So if we get handed, say, a big project that we know is, I mean, just looking at it, it's going to take, you know, you're, it's going to be a year-long project. Oh. If we can have somebody that can help us break down. Yes, breaking it and say, down. Okay, here, here's, the, here's, the broke, here's the big project. Here's yes. the big picture. Here's... Yes. This part, this because part, this we part, can this see the big picture, okay. but we're not seeing the details. And that's why we have to have somebody that can come in and they can see the steps. They're the logical thinkers. They can, they have that sense of time where they know this deadline should be here. This deadline should be here. This deadline should be here. That's why you have, you totally have to work together. Like we can't do it on our own because it's just in our head, a massive project. Where do we start? What are the, you know, what are we working with? So having someone to come in, with a linear mind and and th and those skills to break it down for you and that's exactly what my business partner and I do because he can see the whole he can see the whole picture I build it because I can see it I can build it but then he perfects it so I do the 80 and he does the 20 and that's why we work out so well because we have found even though he has ADHD we have found that we have those different strengths and then putting them together it's like the smartest brain ever. So yeah, and technology is on here too, um, because it's because you're figuring things out, and we love to figure things out. Like when I was a kid, I had a drawer full of calculators and watches that were taken apart because I wanted to see the inner workings. Like I wanted to see how it worked. And so um, yeah, so technology is like a great a great thing. Okay, so this is Crusher TV is. This amazing guy, Alan Brown, you can visit him on CrusherTV.com. He has these TV shows that he does. Um, and these, and and I'll talk about him a little bit later, but it's basically for not just ADHD, but entrepreneurs too, because entrepreneurs mostly are ADHD, right? There's just that like highly ambitious part to them. So anyway, in the workplace, 4.4% um, of adults in the US have ADHD. 85% of them don't know that they even have it. And it costs the economy $221 billion due to absenteeism, reduced productivity, getting fired, showing up late, depression, anxiety, you name it. Um, so what Alan does on Pressure TV is he gives you these brain hacks. And, and that's what I was talking about earlier. And it's these ways that you can hack your brain, which we all know a hack is when you go into a system and you kind of flip some switches to gain an advantage, right? And so the number one brain hack is sugar sucks, carbs kill, protein is power. ADHD brains do not do well with simple carbs at all. We are protein powered people. So in the morning, if you're trying to fuel your brain with pancakes or waffles or bagels or cereal or oatmeal, unless it's steel cut oatmeal that has the fiber in it, you're giving yourself a short burst and then you're gonna peter out. And those energy drinks, it's the same thing. And not only does it do that, but it's also like killing your kidneys. Um, and caffeine is the same thing. So, so you need to, to have, especially in the morning, this protein that will carry that will carry you through, and that is what's feeding your brain. Because when our brain when our brain peters out, there's no oxygen to it. We can't even think, and we don't even know what we're working with at that point. Like you don't know how good your brain could be if you were fueled with the proper proper sources of fuel. And so you know whether it's plant based, because I'm I'm actually vegan. I do everything plant based. I get all the protein I need. Um, or, or if you're a meat eater, whatever, however you get your protein, just make sure it's, it's obviously healthier proteins. Um, and then if you, you know, a lot of times at work you fancy sugar and we were talking about that, Dusty, you're like, there's hot tamales there. Um, and sugar of course is just, is terrible. But if you fancy sugar, the best way to do it is to eat some dried fruit 
and you get those nuts with it and that protein extends that glucose. So it's not just like a short and then you crash. It extends it. It sustains your mental focus if you incorporate that protein. It's hard with kids because all the schools are not free. It drives me crazy. That they're what? All the schools are not free. Oh, I know. It drives me crazy. I know. It's so hard, isn't it? It's so hard for the kids. Yes. Yeah, you have to really get creative on that. Um, do what you're doing now. Okay, so basically, you know when we have something coming at us, so an example is, I know that I have to work on this project. But you know what else sounds equally intriguing is that macaca monkey video that I didn't watch. And I really need to watch that too, right? So that's my brain is going, this macaca monkey video is just as important as writing your presentation. And which one sounds more fun? A uh, macaca whatever video. And so basically, what Alan is saying is you have to, we have to physically label something. This is what I'm doing right now. This presentation is what I'm doing right now. Anything else that comes into the picture is BS. And that's what you say, you're BS. So you light that up. That one thing that you're doing, if you have to put a to-do note on your desk that says to do, and it's that one thing, do that. Anything else that comes at you is BS. So do what you're doing now. And when other things come up, just get rid of them. Getting in the now means, means that what you're working on right there is your issue. Any other things on your to-do list, we see these things as problems. Like our to-do list is problems to us, right? It's not fun stuff. It's problems. So when we're looking at our to-do list, we're like, oh, which problem should I start first? Well, nobody wants to freaking work on a problem. So, so we have to change the way that we look at, at these things and, 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 and not look at them as problems and just say, you know, there's no pro this to-do list is no problem. If it was a problem, I'd be addressing it. If, someone, if something was on fire, I would address it. So I'm going to forget about all this stuff that's like knocking, you know, uh-uh, get out of here. This is where I am right now. Nothing is a problem. Nothing is a problem. Have to versus will do, that is us changing our perception on instead of, oh, I have, to, I have to go do this. It's stressful. You can feel in my body language, in my tone. You know, I, it causes a, a physiological cascade of bad feelings. The cortisol drops because I'm stressed, which means I'm not getting oxygen to my brain. And so, so when I have to do something, as opposed to, you know what, screw that. I'm taking control again and I'm choosing to do this. I am choosing to do this. And you can tell by my body language. If I'm choosing to, I'm owning it. I am powerful, I'm choosing it. It's not gonna run over me, I'm gonna run over it. So change your stuff from have to, to will do. I choose to do this. And give your permission, give yourself permission to fail. Give yourself permission to fail because even if you start on something and you say, I'm going to set the timer for 30 minutes and I don't care if I fail, I'm just going to get started because the getting started thing is the thing we have a problem with, right? So give yourself, just say 30 minutes. If you can't do 30 minutes, give yourself three minutes. Give yourself three minutes, open up the document and name it and save it. And you know what? Tomorrow you'll get on there and you'll have started. You'll have already started. So you push through that barrier already. So those are the things that kind of those brain hacks um, that can help you out. So we can be happy. As ADHDers, we can be happy. I am so happy. Go into flow. Connect or disconnect, depending on how you feel. Serve others. Move your body. Look into meditation and deep breathing because there are so many benefits to it. Unplug from, from your electronics and your social media. Um, eat, your, eat your protein. Eat your brain foods. Practice your alone time. Check in constantly with your moods and your emotions and recalculate as necessary. Expand your perception when you're buried. Become introspective when you're overwhelmed. And you can even use um, like geographical balancing. I use mountains or ocean depending on if I'm feeling too grounded or not. So anyway, mind mapping is a great way for you to organize your thoughts. It's a holistic view as opposed to a linear view. And if you, especially like with the kids, they can relate to this and this is how they can see, and you can see everything clearly when you have a mind map. So anyway, 
that is ADHD. That is understanding our superpowers. And there's so much information. I hope you guys go check it out. And obviously go check out my book, Here's Not Catching Our Hair on Fire. And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Twitter. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you.